Good afternoon all. I've been playing with the uh, PIC development board and the PIC Kit 2 programmer. Oh, I've given away a little uh, secret there. There's a wire mod on the bottom of the board, but uh, more about that later because I've been having a lot of fun writing a little flashing LED routine. There's the LED. It's flashing on and off quite slowly. So I spent most of uh, yesterday evening writing that and it's beautiful. It's exquisite. It's like a fairy tale, that program. I'll come to that in a minute. What isn't quite so exquisite is this board, because I discovered that there's a major problem with it. I was trying to program the chip, and sometimes it was working and sometimes it wasn't. It was an intermittent fault, and as we all know, they're the worst type to try and uh, fault find. But I think I finally tracked it down. So let's have a look at what exactly is wrong with this board and there are more than one thing so gp3 on this particular chip that's uh, io port bit 3 counting from zero of course um also doubles up as the reset it's actually called m clear master clear and it's also vpp the programming voltage now when you're programming this chip the Picket 2 raises VPP up to about 13 volts. It uses a high voltage for programming the flash memory. So you've got multiple functions on GP3. Uh, reset, which requires some circuitry, specifically C4, R5, and the reset switch, this uh, push button here. But it also is connected through to this VPP pin. Now, in the uh, specification document for programming these chips, it says you may have problems unless you do something. Uh, well, I'll show you what you have to do. So uh, this document starts section 28. So I guess it's an excerpt from uh, one of the chip data sheets. But uh, this document has the, uh, the required thing you have to do in it. If I come down to here, there's a diagram showing the required pull-up resistor and uh, capacitor to ensure that master clear is not left floating because if master clear is left floating it can uh, either go up or down and uh, the chip can just reset itself in strange mysterious ways. So you have to put this pull-up and uh, sort of a smoothing capacitor I suppose on that pin but that pin also has to be raised by the programmer, which is here, up to 13 volts. Now that 13 volts supply seems to struggle if there is a, a direct connection between the 13 volts going on here and this resistor, which I think is a 10K on the board, to VDD, which is of course 5 volts. It seems that this resistor holds this 13 volts down a bit. So they suggest putting in this diode. Now they say it should be a shock key diode and that of course isolates the 13 volts the 13 volts can go higher than this point here the diode is then reverse biased and there's no problem but this circuit board the little blue circuit board i bought doesn't have that diode so i started off by cutting this track here to disconnect uh, this line running from vpp down to uh, pin 4 it is of the chip gp3 and uh, I started having no problems at all. That fixed all the uh, funny messages from the programmer saying, I can't see the chip. Where's the chip? So uh, then I decided, uh, well, I was going to put that shock key diode in, but I couldn't find a shock key diode. And then I thought, well, maybe there's a better way of doing this. So I reinstated that link. That's me having cut it and then put it back. And I've cut the wire right up there, up near this VPP pin. So reset the switch. The capacitor, the resistor is all still intact. VPP I've cut and then on the back I've wired VPP to GP3 but on the inner pin. So you can see I've wired it to this side of the link. So if you take that link out you completely disconnect VPP, the programming voltage, from reset or master clear the uh, reset line into the CPU. So all it means is that when you're programming, you remove, well, all the links. So it's quite neat. Program the chip. That all works fine. 
put this link back on, if indeed you set this pin to be master clear, you can also set it to be a general purpose input. You've got a choice over that. Put that link back on and everything works fine. But it does mean carving this board up, fitting this mod wire on the back, all because whoever laid this board out, whoever designed this board, didn't put the shock key diode in that microchip recommend that you have. So now the five lines that go from the programmer to the chip actually go direct. And if you take all of these little header links off, let's take that one off as well. Now all those signals, VPP, VDD, ground, program data and program clock, all run directly to pins on the chip. Now something else I worked out about these links is that if you want GP5 to connect to key 2, key 2 is down here. If you want GP0 to be connected to LED1, you have to fit the links on here. I also thought that you had to fit the VDD and ground links, but you don't. They're just test points, I suppose. And in fact, if you look at the uh, ground connections on the back, I'm not sure how well this is going to show up. Yes, I think you can just about see it. You've got little thermal... Um, bridges coming out onto this ground copper on both pins. So they're actually connected together anyway on the copper tracks. You don't actually need a link on there. It's supplied with links on there, but it's not necessary to link that. They're linked anyway. These are for tapping off grounds and VDDs for things you want to connect up to the chip. That's a bit strange. And there are other oddities. D1 and D2 are obviously hanging anode to the positive rail, anode to VDD, because when you output a zero on a port pin, these LEDs light up. So what's happening is they're being pulled from VC VDD through the diode, through the resistor, and down to ground through the chip. That means they're inverse logic. It means that they light up when you have a logic zero. I mean, normally you'd want LEDs to light up when you have a logic one. It's just annoying. You have to remember that these are inverse logic and uh, that they're not showing you a high and a low in the way you'd normally expect. Just weird and annoying. And then, of course, there's the uh, annoyance when I first got this board that this uh, connector was a JST, which had pins that weren't quite long enough to fit into the programmer. The programmer was also, I'll take that out, stuck on end there and fouled against the uh, DC jack. So I had to replace it with this header. Now I might um, buy myself a, a JST six pin cable and create a, a sort of male array of pins to plug in here. But it's just annoying that they didn't put the uh, proper connector on in the first place and that they didn't put it on in such a way that uh, the pit kit was the right way up so that you could see it. Lots of annoyances on this board. But uh, the problem is there are very few circuit boards on eBay which take um, a pick and which provide you with, you know, keys and LEDs and a pot for doing analog to digital and with a socket on there so that you can uh, power it standalone. And, you know, it's just a very nice little experimenter's board, but it does have a few issues. So if I'm to do these pick tutorials, uh, some of the early ones will be modifying this board so that it actually behaves itself. However, despite all the problems I had with uh, programming this last night, I have managed to get this uh, flashing LED program to work. The LED comes on, now remember that's a logic zero, uh, comes on for 2.3 seconds and then goes off for 2.3 seconds. Now I am actually uh, toggling all bits of the GPIO port, uh, GP0 all the way up to GP5. There are six bits on an 8-pin chip because, of course, uh, two pins are used for VDD and ground. I'm toggling them all, but interestingly, although I've got uh, GP5 and 4, you can see they're linked to LEDs 1 and 2, only one of them is flashing, and that's because this chip, the PIC 12F675, is wonderfully quirky. But uh, here's the program, and uh, I mean, it's it's just poetry. It's absolutely wonderful. It's seven instructions. 
Now I've labelled them uh, the sections setup and loop so that anyone familiar with Arduino will feel right at home here. So in setup, all I do is make all the GPs outputs because very much like the uh, 80 Mega 328P, the Arduino uh, processor, the processor used in Arduino, when you power the chip up, all IOs are inputs because you don't want to blow stuff up. So you have to make all the GPs outputs. That what, that's what that instruction clear F Trizio does. Then in the loop section, which you whiz around lots of times, very simple. I'm just exclusive oring a literal value into the GPIO, which toggles all of the GPIO bits. You probably remember that exclusive or with a one does an invert. So that has the toggling function. And then for the delay, sleep. It's wonderful. It's like, it's like, um, what's that woman called? Sleeping Beauty, that's the one. Almost couldn't remember it. So this is flashing LEDs using sleep and the watchdog timer. Now you'll notice there's no mention of the watchdog timer here. And that is because the default is that the watchdog timer is enabled. And the default settings for the watchdog timer is that it uh, times out after 2.3 seconds. So after sleeping for 2.3 seconds, it uh, comes around the loop again toggles the GPIO bits, then it goes to sleep for another 2.3 seconds, toggles the IO bits again. So if they were high, they then go low. If they were low, they then go high. Poetry. So why is only one of these LEDs flashing? And you can probably guess from the fact that I've used jumper wires from GP5 and GP4 across to the LEDs, that if I put the links on there from GP0 and GP1, to the LEDs, they don't flash either. So although I'm telling all six of these IOs to change state every 2.3 seconds, only one of them's actually doing it. And it's a quirk of the IO hardware in the chip that's making that happen. So here's the data sheet for the PIC 12F675 and the 629. The only difference with the 629 is it doesn't have analog to digital inputs. Um, here is a block diagram of GP0 and GP1. These don't flash. And uh, you can see it's quite a complex block diagram. You've got a right port latch and the Trizio latch, which can tri-state the right port latch out onto the IO pin. Uh, of course, if you set it to an input, the output latch doesn't want to be driving the pin. The pin wants to be able to be read. Now you read it through this route here Here's the read port uh, latch. This is not a clocked latch. This is an enabled latch. So I think it's more of a buffer. And you'll notice there's a gate here which says analog input mode. And this is why it doesn't work because these ports default to analog input mode, which means that when you try to read them, you always read zero. And if you toggle a zero, you always get one. And toggling that doesn't then give you zero again. So it's quite complicated, but this is the reason why it doesn't work. Now, if you look at GP4 and GP5, GP4 doesn't flash. And there's that analog input mode again, gated to stop you being able to read the pin, or at least to make the pin read as zero, even if there's a high voltage on there. If you're in analog input mode, a digital read always reads zero. Here, no analog input mode, because GP5 can't be, doesn't have a, an analog to digital input on it. It has lots of other stuff like global pull-up enable and timer one and interrupt, oh no, internal oscillator. And uh, there probably is interrupts on here. Yeah, interrupt on change. I mean, there's lots of stuff there. But it doesn't have that analog input mode. And therefore this one, we can read it, toggle it and write it back. Read it, toggle it and write it back. And this one actually flips from a one to a zero quite complicated the wiring diagrams of these IO ports. Now what about the watchdog timer? Well watchdog timer period the WDT has a nominal timeout period of 18 milliseconds. If I was switching that LED on and off every 18 milliseconds you wouldn't see it. Um, but it says if longer timeout periods are desired a prescaler with a division ratio of up to 1 to 1 to 8 can be assigned to the watchdog timer under software control. Now, interestingly, the defaults 
for the watchdog timer is that it is enabled and the prescaler is also switched on at 1 to 128. And that means timeout periods up to 2.3 seconds can be realized. And they are by default. Now, just a little bit more uh, stuff to whet your appetite. Here's the section on sleep. When you execute the, execute the sleep instruction, uh, the watchdog timer is cleared but keeps running. Interestingly, when you put the microcontroller to sleep, you shut down its main clock. So the main clock's not running. Most of the microcontroller is completely quiet. But the uh, watchdog timer has its own little resistor capacitor oscillator and that keeps running. Now you might think that the watchdog timer's job is to reboot the CPU if the uh, CPU locks up. And it does if you're not in sleep. However, if you are in sleep, then the watchdog timeout actually wakes the CPU up and it just carries on from where it left off, uh, considered a continuation of program execution. So it just goes on to the next instruction. And in my program after sleep and subsequently being woken up by the watchdog timer, the next instruction simply says go to loop and it just goes round time and time again. So I am making progress uh, towards doing these PIC programming tutorials, but this little demo board has confounded me a little bit. Um, but I'm getting there now. I'm at getting reliable programming. I'm getting the chip to uh, to work and run little flashing LED programs, including Sleeping Beauty, my favourite. Uh, certainly this clone pit kit too, which was about um, eight and a half dollars, I think, something like that. Which last night I was thinking, oh, is this thing playing up? Is this not the, worth the money uh, I paid for it? But uh, since modifying that board, uh, this pit kit too has been absolutely fine. It's programming completely reliably. So uh, I'm entirely happy with this. And I've no doubt the pit kit three clone that I also bought is probably as good. Now, while I was messing around with this yesterday, I wanted to see uh, all the GPIO outputs on LED. So I built these two little uh, Vero board sort of side arms. And you can see that uh, all three LEDs, I've added some extra instructions in to uh, get around this analog input problem. But you can see all, uh, well, five of the GPIOs are flashing. GP3, the LED is not flashing. And that's because GP3 can't be an output. It can only be a digital input or master clear or VPP. You can't use that as an output. So you're never going to get that one to flash, but you can see that they're all flashing. Now, why are these three flashing alternately with these? Well, because on this side of the chip, I've got ground. So these LEDs are uh, hung on the GPU outputs and through a sill resistor, which I actually broke in half because I didn't want the whole thing to ground. On this side, of course, I had to do it the other way around. On this side, I've only got VDD. So these resistors, uh, these LEDs are the other way around. They're going through another sill, which I also broke in half, a single inline resistor. But those are hanging off the VDD line. So very much like these two diodes on the board, these are negative logic. So in fact, the GPIOs are all going high together and all going low together, but these LEDs show them as being the opposite polarity. All a bit daft, really. And I'm not really sure that I'm going to introduce these um, LED boards into my PIC programming tutorials because, well, they were a bit of a hassle to make. And you do have to have, you know, these female headers and break sill resistors in half, which I'm sure people will find pretty horrific. And they're not very useful anyway, because uh, three of the diodes are showing opposite logic to the other three. So I think I'll abandon this idea. But I just really wanted to say uh, I'm getting there with the programmer and the board combination and uh, the PIC programming tutorials will be coming soon. Cheerio.